Angela, I want to talk to you about the last week or the last 10 days for Harry and Meghan, because this feels pretty disastrous. I mean, they were actually heckled leaving the Pat Tillman Award uh, receipt at the ESPYs. So have a look at this and then I'll get you to react off the back. Now, Angela, someone is actually shouting in the audience there, go back to Britain. And all of the choreography around the awards were odd. Venus Williams seemed to be shooting her the evil eye. What, what did you make of what was going on and how they could have messed this up so badly? Well, I think it was um, very foolish of them because in America, um, which they should know by now, um, uh, the Pat Timmons was a, a real hero. Uh, the company, the, 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 all the people uh, felt very, very strongly that he was a wonderful man and he was a hero. Uh, he was a brilliant footballer and then he left that and, and fought after 9-11 and unfortunately died uh, in 2004. But um, his mother, obviously heartbroken, was furious that she wasn't asked who could get the um, present that came with the um, thanking him for being such an amazing man. And she didn't want Harry to have it because she said he, he wasn't right, he'd been awful to his family, and she didn't, he couldn't represent his son. And although he'd worked for Invictus Games, he hadn't done the whole thing and he, he just didn't deserve it. But they continued. And it was very, very uncomfortable all the time. I mean, Megan hung on to him, you know, mm. hold his hand and his arm so he could barely move. And when he went up to get the award, she clung to his hand and he was walking and she was hanging on to it. And in the end, he obviously pushed it away and walked up. Now, what was that about? Was that because she wanted to go up? Um, and hold the award as well. I mean, she likes awards, nothing to do with that, but you don't take other people's which you don't deserve. Um, and she shouldn't be always in the photograph. It's just, um, it's just shocking. But apparently Harry was in a terrible state about it. Backstage, he was um, absolutely distraught about what he should do and what he shouldn't do. And the, the piece that he read was very um, Megan-like, actually. I mean, I went to loads and loads of um, with him where he's been made speeches, and they were very um, open and friendly. But this was sort of loads of boring words that you yeah, didn't. Yeah, he had he about. hadn't written that. He no, hadn't no. written that. Absolutely okay. not. And I thought, Angela, what was really interesting is that he looked terrified when he was yes. walking up. So clearly what Meghan had hoped is that Harry was going to take her arm and say, come up with me, come up with me. But he didn't. He didn't actually want her up there on the stage. And the reason he was terrified, and I think he probably knows that if Meghan was on the stage, there was more chance of this happening is he was terrified of being booed because he was heckled on the way out. And I mean, in the end, people were respectful during the speech, but I don't think he got a particularly loud, positive reaction. No, but it's very rude because as soon as that particular event had happened, they were leaving. I think if you go to one of these organisations, which is to thank people for doing wonderful things, you don't walk out in the middle. That's incredibly rude, isn't it? You just wait. Even if it's boring for you, you don't sort of walk out. It's, it's very bad manners. Um, and, and, and they rushed out just after Harry had said his uh, speech. Um, and I think that it was just a disaster. They need to know now where they stand, what they do, that they can't take other people's success and pretend it's their own. They just can't do that. They need to build their own life, but they don't seem able to. They're hanging on to their royal details and actually um, not living their own lives, which is, seems very strange 
very strange. If they're that, if they're together and they're even the slightest bit happy, let them do what they want, not try and spoil things for other people. When he talked about um, Pat's mother, um, obviously Harry mm. would think of his own mother, but then he should know. He said, I respect you, I understand you, but then he did nothing. Well, what does that mean? You know, if he understood the relationship between a mother and a son, which is quite understandable, then you don't actually then um, make it very unpleasant for her. You make it as uh, as easy as you can. You you don't take it away from her, make her even more unhappy that you've uh, got the award. Exactly. Mary Tillman had said she didn't want you to accept this award. If you had any respect for that woman, you would not have accepted it. You would have said, I've heard what she's said. She is Pat Tillman's mother. I'm going to respect her. He did not do that. Instead, what he tried to do was curry sympathy by talking about her during the speech, which I just thought was completely grim. And it shows how tone deaf he is to anyone else's feelings. He only seems to care about his own feelings. And we've seen that time and again, haven't we, with his own family too? Yes, but this is extraordinary because when I was with him for 15 months, mm. he understood everybody's feelings. Mm. He was brilliant with people who had been um, uh, had been injured and he was marvellous with them and he could get them round. And several of them, after he walked to speak to someone else, would say to me, he's given me the feeling that I should live. Um, nobody else has been able to. I've lived in darkened rooms for for years now, but he's actually told me there is a life and he's helped me feel like that. He's been talking to him for only five minutes. So he has got that feeling. It's his mother's um, way of being uh, kind and nice and helpful to other people. But I think with Megan, he just is a very, very different person and that he becomes determined and uh, unkind. Exactly. And what's so interesting at the moment, Angela, is that this has now been widely considered Harry and Meghan's flop era. It's like everything they touch turns to the opposite of gold. And I just wonder how you think they're going to turn this around because the Nigerian tour was a disaster. Yes. This has now been a disaster. I mean, is there a way for, for them to claim back the narrative? Well, I think it's jolly difficult, isn't it? I think they have to sit down and talk it through and not keep on going on and on and on about the things they don't like of what have happened and try to win. Um, I think that's a problem. I think they should uh, be very quiet and be together and not try and grab everything that um, isn't theirs. I, it's terrible. And the other thing that I think people don't like is the fact that um, nobody sees their children uh, it's very difficult to understand this allegedly happy couple um, who just hide their children. Uh, it's very difficult for the children because they don't have a family on their mother's side apart from their grandmother um, and they don't see anybody on their uh, father's side. And I think that's very hard for children not to know that they're a big family and they have lots of people who love them. I, I find that very peculiar. And I think they should spend a lot of time with their children, take them out, take them round, and, and actually be ordinary people because they're no longer royals and they could have a lovely life if they um, looked after their manners. Well, it's interesting, actually, because we've had lots of questions coming in for you today, Ange uh, Angela, and there's a, a question on a similar theme there from Jane Knight, who says, I really feel for Charles not seeing Archie and Lilybeard, except over video. Are they being held as a form of ransom or blackmail, do you think? If so, leverage for what? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, I think the blackmail uh, might be a very exaggerated word, but I also feel um, they have said, you know, unless they get this 24-7 um, police protection, they will not bring their children over. So that is... Um, and they're not going to get that. 
they're not going to get that. They're not going to get that. And I think that's uh, the wrong way to behave. Um, they have occasionally seen them via Zoom, but you know, little children like that, two and four, they're not going to be interested in conversations. It's just like two or three words. And I think, you know, Charles would, the king would love to see them actually it, it, where he could play with them and, and take them around the gardens and live in the country. But um, I think they, they're holding that back. That's my impression, um, mm. because they won't do that unless they get exactly what they want from the royals. Yeah, these two children, Archie and Lilibet, are being denied so yeah. much. Mm. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, being a bit of a clairvoyant here, if yeah. in the future... It's either Archie or Lilibet who have the same reaction to Meghan as she's having to her current father, Thomas Markle, because it's quite possible, Angela, they'll be saying, why did you deny us this relationship with our grandfather who happens to be king, with our grandfather on our maternal side who was an Emmy winner? You can't get those moments and those relationships back, let alone, by the way, their, their cousins are... Uh, because that relationship is really important too. And they have no relationship with George and Charlotte and Louis, who were so young when yes. they met. Yes, I, I think it's a, a huge shame. But another thing that I think Lilibet will be very cross about, you know, Megan is a, a feminist, she says, and very strong about that, that there's only an Archie Foundation. Mm. There is a foundation for Lilibet. Now, that's not fair, is it? Um, and I think if they don't do one and she grows up, why has she been missed out? I think you've got to be very careful with children. You can't just give one something and not the other. It's really not fair. Um, and although that might sound silly, I think that um, if they're so proud of Archie Federation, they should do something that's for her as well. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many... a feminist mother, especially. And there's so many questions around the children and why they don't want them to be seen in public. And it's all very odd, isn't it? Yes, very odd, very odd and unnecessary, actually. I mean, if you want um, people to really like you and get to know you as a couple, um, you should be seen as a family as well. It makes sort of sense. It makes you think, what are they hiding and why are they hiding it? Mm. Uh, it can't be just... For protection i don't believe in that although harry is obsessed with uh, making sure that they're safe but then um lots of families do that and i think he should be he can still be careful but let people see who they are especially when it's birthdays well look from a career perspective i think they are in a dire place things have gone from bad to worse it's really hard to see these two new netflix series turning things around in fact i think probably they'll be a disaster i mean no one is interested in this polo series with harry and i think megan has proven with archetypes that actually the more that she lets us in to these conversations with her uber privileged hollywood friends the more that we realise how out of touch this woman is with real life. Yeah, I think she is out of touch because she sees everything from her own uh, view and that it's all about how people are reacting to her and how they're behaving. And she, I think she's actually um, doesn't really trust herself and she feels very neurotic about things. And that makes her see the darkness and that people are trying to attack her. They're not, it's just the fact that she says and does things that a lot of people don't like and um, they're fed up with them. Now, of course, I guess uh, in terms of popular royals, no one is more popular at the moment than Catherine the Princess of Wales, who returned remarkably to the spotlight again, unexpectedly too, but she clearly wanted to be at the men's final of Wimbledon. She went with her sister Pippa and her daughter Charlotte, who was clearly just in awe of her mum looking so well and being out in public. There was a beautiful moment when she received a standing ovation from the Wimbledon crowd. And I had friends who were in the audience, family members who were in the audience, who said it was just completely electric and all eyes were on Catherine. Uh, 
she is looking great, but but you are concerned about how thin she is given the treatment yes. she's going through. Yes, I think she's very, very slim. And um, also I imagine that um, that would be enough for her to do for a long time. I got very anxious that the match wouldn't go on for very long because I thought, well, okay, she can sit for a couple of hours, but much longer, I hope she will be okay. And when she stood up to give the award, I just felt again, uh, you know, I hope it's not too heavy. So I, it came across to me that she's still, um, it's still quite difficult for her. And she she will now not do anything for quite a while. I think the people who said, oh, it's wonderful that she's back working again, but I, I don't think she is back working again at all. I think it's going to be a much longer, a longer lasting event um, and it is a it is a shame but I think to have Charlotte there and her sister would be a very helpful for her that she would feel um, safe and enjoy it very much but if you remember that if you've seen her before when she comes down when it's the finals uh, she quickly comes and sits down to, to make no fuss, no fuss at all. But this time she obviously thought, my goodness, I will stand up and wave. And it was very moving. It was lovely. Thousands of people cheering her. And I think it's very nice because um, it shows that she's wanted and she's admired and she's, she's lovely and she just needs to get well. Well, especially given the amount of rubbish that she was put through from the online trolls, so much was driven, as we spoke about at the time, by the dastardly, awful Sussex squad who were perpetuating these ridiculous rumours about her. And I think it's beautiful that she was able to be in a space like that where she could feel the true warmth and the true love, especially given it's at Wimbledon, a place that is home to such happy memories for her. I mean, it's certainly probably her favourite duty as a royal, given that she's such a tennis fan and her mum and dad were brought up as such tennis fans. And I think what's good, Angela, is the conspiracy theories have to stop now. And you know I actually hate using the term conspiracy theory because so often conspiracy theories turn out to be true. And we've seen that over the past few years, but not when it comes to Catherine. They weren't conspiracy theories. Actually, they were just malicious lies, weren't they? And so now that we've seen her a couple of times, it's not such a big deal. I want her to take all the time she needs. But as long as she pops up every couple of months to, to, to show us she's doing well, that's enough, you know? Yes, I think it's very important that, as the doctors have said, that she needs peace and quiet. Yes. And that's why she asked the press not to make too much of a fuss about her, um, that she, that's what she needs. And I think that's what will help her if she goes to Scotland and there with the fresh air and the lovely scenery. I mean, that will help. But she does need it. I mean, it's very, very tiring um, when you have all these uh, cancer treatment and she does need to be quiet and rest and save her energy when the children come home from school. I think that's what she's doing, which makes sense. Um, they're out during the day and she can rest and then be with them. But when you see little um, her daughter looking up at her absolutely ador in adoration, you realise that here is a wonderful mother as well as a wonderful princess. Just absolutely beautiful. Uh, look, Angela, time for a couple more questions uh, before we go to you. And another big royal piece of news this week was, of course, the announcement that King Charles will be going on this tour, a big trip too. And so Helen O'Driscoll is a little bit concerned about this. And she says, I'd love an explanation because there's been a mess of contradictory things published about the King's upcoming Aussie trip. One, is it wise for him to go, given his health? Two, what about New Zealand? And three, the King wrote to Donald Trump. Uh, that was Donald Trump was mad about Queen Elizabeth II. Mad as in he adored Queen Elizabeth II. So uh, let's save the Donald Trump and we'll, we'll, we'll come to that separately. But do you think it's wise for him to go on this trip, Angela, given how unwell he is? 
Well, I think it had to be fixed now because of all the things that are happening. Um, summer holiday, things don't happen and they need to get organised where they're staying, what they're going to do and the places they're visiting. Now, if the doctor says to him a bit nearer, I'm sorry, I thought you'd be OK, but um, you're, you haven't got quite the right line to actually go, I think they'll just cancel it. I think that's what will happen. We don't have to worry too much, but I think that this um, you know, should be just underlined now. Uh, but if you work it out, they'll only be there about a week because they've taken in the travel and it's going to be just 10 days, I think, altogether with, with the journeys. And they're only going to do two or three things a day, whereas before, I know Charles fits absolutely as much as he can in, and he will do about 10, 12 things. It's, it's absolutely exhausting. And his aides have said to me, they come back absolutely wiped out. They have to have a couple of days off. And he goes straight into the next um, engagement that he's got. So um, he did have loads of energy, but he has to wait till that comes back. And I think with New Zealand, um, it's another four hours flight. And I think it's best if he just does the one thing. And New Zealand is very fond of us uh, and he can go there another time. But I think he very, very much wanted to be one of the Commonwealth countries. Um, he's missed out on that and he wants to show that he's still there for them and he's very keen on them. And so I think this is the way they've worked it out. And I hope that he will be well if he has a good rest and the holiday up in Scotland. So that's maybe another reason for quiet and peace. Um, and then he gets ready to go. But this this last week, he's been incredibly busy. Um, he's done so much. And so you think that it actually he has got some energy, even though he's having the treatment every week. Um, he is quite strong. And if, if they take it carefully, and if he listens to Camilla uh, and the doctors who will be in close contact, and I'm sure some of them will fly over there as well with him to look after him, um, that things will work out well. Yeah, indeed. I mean, look, obviously, from my perspective, uh, being a New Zealand Brit, having joint citizenship, it's sad that he couldn't make the trip to New Zealand, but I think something had to give. And as you quite correctly point out, there's much more love at the moment for the royal family in New Zealand. In Australia, where they have this left-wing government led by Anthony Albanese, actually, there's been quite a push for the Republican movement. And Anthony Albanese is a Republican. So I would say from a political perspective, it was much more important for him to get to Australia to try and save the monarchy there rather than uh, go to New Zealand. And look, just finally, a question from Jane Angela, who's actually talking a little bit about uh, your job. And she says, in the world of royal correspondence, where I assume paths cross, is there rivalry or camaraderie, or is it just a random group covering the same broad topic? And I'm fascinated by your answer to this. <laughs> well, I'm not somebody who wants to go and have a fight with someone else who's talking. I love to give you my views on everything and I love to be at places and I love to hear what people tell me uh, and can keep secret. But um, I'm not somebody who wants to grab things from other people. But I think nobody talks like I do, just like I don't talk like anybody else does. And I, I just get on with my job. I think I'm very lucky. And a lot of it is um, a great honour to do. But I, I'm not sort of greedy or sly or anything like that. No, so far. Absolutely. So far. <laughs> you're absolutely not. And obviously, there's a lot of camaraderie between us two, even if other people may not like us. Uh, but I'm sure everyone loves you, Angela. But you know me. I, 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 I shook things up in that world of royal reporters because they're quite a closed off bunch. That's how I view it anyway. But well, then when you were at the Sun, that yeah. you. you it yeah. then? Oh. Well, you see, I've always been independent. I just get on with it. Um, and I think that makes a difference. It's it's up to me. And I approach people and uh, talk to them. Uh, I, I just 
I just get on with it. Well, independent is the way to be. It is the way to be now because it means we report the truth. What I didn't like, you see, Angela, is how the royal rota would often work together and uh, sometimes become a PR for the royal family. I mean, we're royalists, but we have to cover them honestly and we have to tell the truth. And I think sometimes those relationships become a little bit blurred within the journalists who are covering the royal family every single day and are on the royal rota but it's, it, it, it's an it's an interesting one isn't it thank you so much for watching dan Wilson outspoken please do subscribe if you want lots more clips and interviews like that plus if you want to watch our totally uncensored after show then visit www.outspoken.live